Welcome to Government CIO's The Agile Advocate Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Drew. Welcome to the third and final series of podcasts inspired by Al Dupre's blog post titled The DevOps Entry Point, Context, Maturity, Then Metrics. In the initial podcast, we talked about the early IT pioneers and how they shaped our approaches and perceptions, both good and bad. In the second podcast, we discussed the first steps to take on that DevOps journey and how to establish the foundation for success. In this final podcast, we're going to identify a key role in staffing that DevOps office, some innovative metrics for tracking your progress, as well as how and when to best apply those metrics. Today, I have back in the studio Al Dupre, former Director of Innovation at NIST and Chief Information Officer for the Congressional Budget Office. Once again, welcome back to the podcast, Al. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be here. So once again, full disclosure, we've known each other now for 30 years, personally and professionally. So we share a lot of inside information, and maybe that's where some of the conversation can be explained at times. Al, for those who missed the first podcast, give a brief recap of your background. Okay. And one other thing to add to our history together, and that's, for me anyway, you and I were on the watershed project of my career, the one in which I can say a great deal of my professional direction was set, that being, of course, Intelsat. Okay, so what's my background? I came out of a very strange educational background for this that would have been public policy at Carnegie Mellon University. But because of the technological bend of the school, a lot of the big six would recruit out of there because we came cheap. So I ended up at Arthur Anderson, which is where I met you, spent some time in the big six, spent some time at General Electric, which is where we worked together. Subsequent to that, I had a really interesting odyssey went through manufacturing with Black & Decker. I started a couple of companies of my own, and then I wound up in the public sector with one of my clients, one of those company clients after I had driven them into the ground, that client being the Congressional Budget Office. From there, it was to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and as they say, the rest is history. Before we jump into this third podcast, give our listeners your recap of what we talked about in the first and second podcast. Absolutely. So, again, our history together has included some fairly major software development efforts. And while in the instances in which we've worked together, we've been successful at delivering product to the client, it hasn't always been done in a way that was either comfortable or that didn't threaten marriages and long-term relationships. The one in particular was more or less what is described as a death march to Bataan. Okay, so it caused me to start thinking about software, custom software development in particular. And as I progressed through my career and watched the way people behave, then some specific conclusions started to dawn on me. And those conclusions caused me to wonder, okay, where did all of this come from? So that's what started number one. How did we get here? How did we arrive at the place that we are with respect to custom software development? And that ultimately, as far as I can see, has been largely driven by a number of market forces, and in particular, some specific concerns within those markets. Now, I greatly simplify the influences in part one, to the likes of IBM and Big Iron and Anderson Consulting and custom software development. And that is horribly simplified, but it still illuminates the importance of those particular concerns and how they shaped how we approach the process. Speaking of the process, that kind of takes us to the second part of the series in which we talk about how we've always seemed to focus on the product of the process, but never seem to focus on the process itself, on how we go about maturing our capacity to deliver software in a fashion that is predictable and acceptable to the business. So that kind of summarizes parts one and two. So from there... It's amazing 
that we don't give as much care, like you said, in how we make something and we're trusting that it was made correctly in the way we want and we then accept it. In fairness, if we watch the way manufacturing has developed, you know, it was several decades before Deming and the like took a look at what Henry Ford originated and suggested that there might be some significant differences introduced that would improve it. So Six Sigma didn't come along immediately. And I contend that we are at about a place now where capability maturity model is appropriate for thinking about how we do our thing. So it's about time we start doing this. Pretty much. I love this. You start at one section, prepare your evangelists. So run with that one. And by the way, these evangelists, quote, unparalleled subject matter expertise, a passion for change, and boundless energy. So just uh, straight up, if you can find a good handful of those guys, send them my way. Indeed. So actually, it's kind of interesting. There are people who fit that bill essentially from their role in the organization. Business process analysts, business process engineers, folks that I've had the opportunity to work with very closely in my most recent experience at NIST, bring just that to the table. It's fascinating. Almost to a person, and I hired one and and had several reporting to me as, as a result of innovation and solutions, the division. To a person, they are subject matter experts. I did not find a tremendous amount of variation in the content that they were aware of. They are extraordinarily enthusiastic and their energy seems limitless. So it's not as scarce a resource as you think. It's just perhaps we haven't been looking in the right places for it. That's possible. We tend to um, get stuck on some acronyms behind your name. Yes. So are you suggesting that somebody that may not have a CS background, a technology background, a software background, focusing on the leaning out, improving the process, making it better, it might be a better candidate? Indeed. And it's a fascinating proposition, having seen it at work, that it does in fact work. I did not choose either the evangelist title or whatever. I'd hang with it. It's beautiful. Indeed by accident or the people that I expect to populate it by accident, that they fit and it makes sense and it clicks into place just beautifully. It gets people's attention, let me tell you that. Indeed, it does. So metrics. Mm -hmm. And as you said, there are lots of metrics out there. Yes. Troll the internet, you can find a bunch of them. Yes. I like that you take it a bit further with the when, where, and how to apply the metrics not simply taking them all and at every stage just applying them and making them a rule law. So let's stop and think about the proposal thus far. Thus far I've said we've shaped ourselves according to some specific market kinds of forces that haven't been in our interest and that we haven't taken a long hard look at how we've matured in any way shape or form even with the processes that we have in place that in many instances are not appropriate. So then how do we break that paradigm? How do we break that habit, that mold that we come to exist in? The thought in my mind, the proposition in my mind is really fairly straightforward. You have to look at yourself, as I said in the article, cold eyed and cold sober and decide what it is you're capable of not what does the business want me to deliver, but what is it that I'm capable of? And once I've come to the conclusion, staring at myself in the mirror and being just horribly honest, what I'm capable of is going to be subject to different measures. If I am a world-class athlete, I can run the quarter mile in under a minute. If, however, I have been a couch potato for the last 10 years and popping Twinkies and so forth, then I can't expect to kill that quarter in anything less than five minutes. 
the metrics, the measures that are appropriate for where I stand in my development must be taken into account. It's just kind of that easy. So yes, I think metrics are a function of where you are in terms of your maturity. It's a hard thing to do that initial true assessment. Organizations don't want to hear the truth. So that's a difficult thing to do, but absolutely agree. If you don't know where you are, don't know where you want to go. You may know where you want to go, but it's really not fair to the organization and you're not going to get much out of your metrics if you think you're actually far more mature than you are. Mm -hmm. I really like these process participation metrics that you came up with. And I fully admit they're totally new to me, but I really like them because they drive participants to the table to make sure that they're getting involved. They're totally new to you because I totally made them up. Damn, and I you am, are good. <laughs> well, we'll find out, won't we? I am suggesting that these are appropriate for the folks who are early in the process, early in the maturation cycle, because the culture change that you're looking to drive is fundamentally based, supported, sustained by participation. Oh, absolutely. There. If you don't have the team put together and you don't define what a team is, it doesn't mean sitting on the sixth floor flailing emails at me and I can't even identify you in a lineup. That's not a team. No. You're not going to find a huge popularity push on these, dragging people to the table, showing that they're not participating, and you're going to be putting names next to that. That should be fun. But I think that they're really important. In addition, there's one that I absolutely struggled with when first formulating and then writing it down and trying to make it, for lack of a better, palatable. The notion of skills deficits is not something that is likely to make me or anyone that applies it very popular. But again, the whole proposition here is to do the best that you can to jettison the things that we retain from history that are not useful to us and to adopt those things that we have available to us now that will improve our ability to deliver. And one of those is a simple proposition that I've seen defied in more organizations than I care to count, and that's glossing over the inability of specific individuals to contribute at the level that they are expected. So again, there's this whole notion of culture change, clear-eyed, cold, sober, and honest. This gives you, though, a specific thing to drive that culture change. People can point at and say, eh, we're doing okay, or we're not doing well at all. Because, I mean, how are you going to measure this culture change? That's tough. But it also says, I'm thinking about it, I'm measuring it, and anytime you measure anything, it tends to improve, which is good. Right. So you're absolutely right when you point out measuring culture is phenomenally difficult thing to do. So I don't claim that I am measuring culture or the cultural change. How about this? I'm sorry, but how about not culture, hmm? organizational shift of resources? And emphasis, yes. Absolutely. So stop and think the current kind of circumstance is one in which, as you say, you're flailing away with email from the eighth floor or throwing flaming God knows what through the transom. So in order to battle that, in order to battle or to counter the notion of it's your fault no it's your fault no it's your fault the first proposition is to get everyone in the room and around the table and discussing things in terms of us and not you and I does that happen overnight certainly not does it require the boundless energy and subject matter expertise of an evangelist to point out when it's not happening, it absolutely does. And over time, will it occur? Yes, it will. In much the same way that we've been driven into stovepipes in the respective corners of our room over last five decades, we can bring that same shift to bear in this set of circumstances. I don't know if it takes an evangelist 
But it does take somebody who has really strong, and I hate to overuse this word, but leadership skills. And somebody who can actually get people to own problems or the team to own problems. If you can do that, if you can get away from the finger pointing, as you say, failure is not fatal by any stretch. Finger pointing is. is. Yes. So if you can get somebody who can make sure that that doesn't happen, you get to that point, it's an amazingly productive way to start to get people to work together. I would suggest to you that we are saying perhaps the same thing and maybe implementing it at different levels of the organization. I tend to think of the evangelist as an example of leadership, that you're out and you're proselytizing and you're being very candid with people about what they've delivered and what they haven't. You're being very straightforward about what the expectations of the organization are and how you are expected to work together and what the results will look like if, in fact, that occurs. All of that constitutes leadership from where I sit. It just happens to be you're down in the foxhole in the trenches with those people. I don't have any issue whatsoever with leadership occurring from on high either. I will say this. The evangelical role, as I point out in the post, is something that I first encountered at Palm Computing When I was pitching for venture capital in the mid-90s, they had adopted it from Apple. And ultimately, I have to say, in the instance of both organizations, Palm over a very short period of success, Apple over a very, very long period of success, have demonstrated that at some point, this role is useful. So you're adding leadership onto that too, my evangelist? Sure, Again, if you have a handful... Route them my way. (laughs) So we've established a benchmark with the early metrics in CMMI level one. Then you progress to level two and three in managed stage. Seem to be introducing metrics that now push the limits. Where you had your other metrics, you said establish the baseline. Now you're pushing the limits with these new metrics in this stage. There are two things to take into account with that. The first is, yes, you're absolutely right. In the initial phases, when you measure the degree or the cycle time for release, you're looking at trying to establish what the limits of the organization are at present. How good can we be? How much can we do this? Later on, the proposition is to push the organization to see just how far you can take it not what can we bring to the table as we stand right now rather if we really really push this really tweak it really try to demonstrate just how good we can be how far can we take this so we start twisting the dials up yes certain places and and twisting the tails yes seeing where quality may suffer yes delivery may suffer yes both of them may suffer or possibly they may get better and better but we got to figure out what the right mix of gas and oil is. Correct. Absolutely. You take that a step further and you realize if you're promoting this cultural change as you're going about this, what you find is, at least in the one or two experiences I've been able to witness this transformation, what you find is that you don't need the organization to twist the tail that the team itself starts to seek to find higher and higher levels of performance. But attendant with that is something that I put at the very end of one of the final paragraphs that I don't really have a tremendous amount of space to put into within the scope of this, but needs to be said nonetheless And that's how fast you go and how hard you go and et cetera is all a function of whether or not you have a marketplace and a business that is intent upon leaning in because technology is going to follow the lead of the business. So do you have a business or an enterprise that's under competitive pressure? The other things that you need to look at are whether or not the platforms that you are presently developing with are subject to tremendous amounts of market 
kinds of power from their vendors, all adds up to you've got to assess the risks. Manage the risk. And that has to be a mutual process. How much risk I am willing to stomach? As a business and as a technologist, mm -hmm. yes. Getting my velocity up to insane levels, having, as one Air Force pilot told me, having all thrust and no vector is a dangerous proposition. Yes, absolutely. And deciding that you're going to dump everything on the afterburner just to see how fast it will go is also not a recipe for success. The question is, am I being responsive to the business? Am I providing the level of cycle and support and agility that the business requires to address its market challenges? I'm not doing systems for systems sake. I'm doing systems because I am supporting an enterprise. So we're looking at um, the CMI model. And as an organization matures into CMI level four and five, the mature stages, you talk about SLAs and quantitative measures, especially the customer satisfaction measure. Talk to me about that one. It struck me not long ago, and again, it's one of the reasons, one of the impetus for the article, the blog post. When is the last time that you delivered a piece of software and talk to the user about whether or not they actually liked it. Not did it do its job, not is it bug free, not is it responsive in the appropriate fashion, but do you like the darn thing? And the answer that came back to me is I've never asked anyone that. There is at least one article out there that suggests that User satisfaction is not an unusual or unreasonable thing to measure when delivering technology to an organization. So, yeah, I think customer satisfaction should be built into that. It's a hard thing to measure. So I had a product, as you know. I had some type A users on the other end as air traffic controllers, air traffic managers, pilots. And I asked them a few times. And they told me it was hard at times for them, and they didn't hold back anything. They tend not to do that. So it's hard. And so what happens, I think, is somebody doesn't want them, you know, march up the baby and say, what do you think? So that's a difficult proposition. And when you get that first thump, natural thing is to recoil, go back to your corner. But what you got to do is be a salesman here. Yep. You got to walk up, go, thank you very much. You know, I put my heart and soul in this, but I'm sorry it didn't meet your satisfaction. But how do I do that? And you've got to remove the degrees of separation there, too. If you do that, Fair. if you do that, it's great. But degrees of separation are very comforting. And so people start to push more and more into those. Let's parse what you just said into a couple of different pieces. The first thing I want to fall on is you said you have to be something of a salesman. And you're absolutely right. You didn't think I'd ever you say did. that. Well, I didn't, but I'm ready to cut you a commission check right here. You have to be the salesman. You have to be the person who is willing to take rejection over and over again because you realize that in that rejection, I will generate a great deal of strength, a great deal of resilience. And in the instance of software and product development, that means that my product gets stronger. Um, my wife is a writer, and I've tried my hand at it as well, I mean, beyond the blog posts. And one of her phrases that just kind of continues to resonate in my head is, you have to kill your darlings, meaning all of those favorite places and pieces inside of the product that you've put on the table, you have to be willing to stab them. You have to be willing to hack them off. And your user can help you with that because while you think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, um, that user may find it particularly uh, a nuisance or aggravating or whatever. And you're attached to it, but it's amazing the relationship that develops when you get to kill that darling at the behest of your customer. All in, 
I think it's extraordinarily important to just essentially man up and say, I'm doing this for you. If you don't like it, then ultimately I have failed. Or at least I have not fulfilled my mission. It's hard to equate those with kill my babies there, but I can relate to that. Several times, I marched out some software. I proudly marched in front of a couple of professors who looked right by the wonderful work I had done, looked at three digits that were flipping over in a block, and they said, boy, that's nice. I'm like, wow. So, so that other piece? Yeah, whatever. So I totally understand. But like in any salesman, you're going to get what? Far more rejections than you are, but it guides where your product should go. Yes. Yes, it does. And ultimately, as any writer will tell you, when you submit to that process and you include those people in that way, it's no longer my product. It then becomes ours. Our product, and, and that's really key. And again, we're going back to that culture shift. This can't be about me versus you or us versus them. This is about our thing. So you'll get a charge out of this one from a guy who thought that just the latest bells and whistles was the only thing I needed to deliver and technology should stand on its own. Really, what I would say in DevOps and this agile proposition, it is just that. You are guiding your product, our product, into the perfect space for you as an end user. Not what I think mm. alone. Mm. It's about what we think and how we get it to there. Mm. So it really is me listening to you talk about how you want that product shaped. Yes. And if you add to that the shorter cycle time. And the different, sorry, but the separation between me and you. If I sit next to you, there's no email. Don't do the email. Don't yes. do the proxy people that are going to represent you. Right. Talk to me. I shrink the space. I establish proximity. I shorten the cycle. And I take the notion of technology for technology's sake off the table. What's not to like in that equation? I mean, ultimately, that provides for the basis for business success. And let's face it. The bells and whistles that you and I have come to know and love and find attractive and so forth, some of them, some of your darlings, will find their way into that final product. But ultimately, it's decided, or the arbiter of whether or not it's included, is the user. That's where it belongs. So, that just about wraps it up. So, it has been a great series. It has. I've enjoyed this, and I appreciate the opportunity. Try to bring it all together for us with some final thoughts. Agile and DevOps represents that watershed spot that happens periodically in business functions that will allow us to pivot and to address the challenges that are before us in ways that are completely different if we seize that opportunity that we can leave the ravages of waterfall behind us, that we can leave the stovepipe approach to organizing ourselves behind us, and we can take on the challenges of having to deliver at faster and faster rates in ways that are more appropriate to that challenge that we are no longer going to work against ourselves. But if you realize where you came from and you realize what you're missing, that you can establish and chart a course for where you need to go. Well said. So, as I said, that's the final podcast in this series. Thanks again for coming down. I understand that you're putting finishing touches on another series, so we may see you again soon. That is my hope. Thanks a lot. Indeed. Thank you, Bill. The Agile Advocate is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentcio.com slash podcasts. The Agile Advocate is produced by Amy Kluber. It is hosted by Bill Drew. 
Edited by Resonate Recordings. Theme music provided by Big Hoax. If you're interested in sponsoring a podcast, contact Joe O'Neill at J-O-N-E-I-L-L at governmentcio.com.